This is Brian Coffrin, a.k.a. Justin Carter. I'm a security industry specialist who worked for a private security company in Seattle, Washington. I am no longer employed by this company. I chose to leave because I could no longer in good conscience work for a corrupt company that is involved in a highly illegal federal program that is blatantly violating the constitutional rights of American citizens on a daily basis. The military, you know, they pioneered the internet, DARPA, and now they are pioneering uh, our interface to our brain. For that, we really need to measure every neuron and at appropriate speeds um, and long periods of time. And that's what the Brain Initiative is about. They asked us to go and measure the activity in a living brain and map exhaustively the wiring diagram of every neuron connecting to every other neuron. And we're, uh, as part of the Brain Initiative, thinking about the Rosetta Brain, where we don't, we're not picking one particular winning technology, we're trying to stimulate new uh, innovative technologies and to integrate them all into one brain and do that over and over again in, in different brains, in different patholo pathological settings in humans. And then from there, IARPA wants us to deliver the brain up to the cloud. So this is a 40 gigabit per second brocade switch to the Internet 2 infrastructure. So this is like the fast, fast Internet. And we upload that brain to the cloud. And here's a laundry list of the types of uh, bytes that we need to, to store this information. If you're interested in brain uploading and downloading, these are the kind of absolute minimum numbers that you need to be considering. But it's not out of range. It's not necessarily far off in the future. And if you think the internet is big, if you think blockchain is big, this is going to blow it all away. Because there's nothing bigger than connecting our minds to the internet. I find it interesting that that's what's going on. That's what they're admitting. They're saying, hey, this Microns project is going straight to the source. We're not taking it from the global internet perspective. We're taking it from the brain itself. And eventually, those two things will merge. So the public announcement of a project like this is pretty telling about where we are. It's so funny because the, the military contacted me and asked if I would help them. And I'm reluctant to do that because I like talking about everything. <laughs> and it would be top secret, whatever they told me. So it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I have a lot of ideas, but I don't want to know what you're doing because I only want to know it's public. So this is public. Um, but how they're doing it is not public. And the different applications for it on the battlefield are not public. It is with laws that protect whistleblowers in mind that I am choosing to make this information available to the public. By doing so, I hope to put pressure on those in power in this country to investigate those involved in this social engineering program and bring them to justice. There are new technologies, and a lot of them are being developed by startups and the military uh, that are going to allow us to much more accurately uh, m uh, measure and actually communicate with your brain. Now, the nice thing about this technology is it's non-invasive, meaning they don't have to crack open your skull and put a chip inside. The true way that this technology works is that a complete DNA profile is obtained from the target, from the individual, the targeted individual. And then this information, the DNA of the individual, is used to determine the resonant frequency of the DNA itself. The resonant frequency is then used to fine-tune the technology, the radio frequency signals, the microwave auditory effects, and all of the other aspects of the technology to tune it perfectly to the resonant frequency of the targeted individual's DNA. And they can read your thoughts verbatim as they occur within your own mind. We can generate an electronic signal that's characteristic for the DNA. This can read DNA from solution, and your blood is a solution, it's a liquid. We can decode it into a form that can be read by a computer. And in a way, you can think about uh, DNA as uh, digital information moving through a tube. Now, if we can tap into that tube, uh, like a network, and we can read that information, we can intercept what's happening in people, you can make them an extension of the internet. And, uh, you know, I, I have a thermostat at home that's on my iPad. I can change, I can warm the house up before I get home. People call that the Internet of Things. We call this the Internet of Living Things. 
Much like any information, biometric information, digital information can be susceptible. We know that genetic information and DNA uh, sequencing information is highly sought after by adversaries. The memo says the kits could expose personal and genetic information and potentially create unintended security consequences and increased risk. It also says the data in the wrong hands could be used to conduct mass surveillance or to track individuals. There are many military applications for having, maintaining, and using DNA data sets. There are new technologies that are coming out. Technology called biocoded directed energy. Mm -hmm. And that's a top secret thing that was developed. And what it is, is they get your DNA. Once they have your DNA, they take the DNA and they put the D your DNA code in a supercomputer. And in that supercomputer, they run algorithms that biocode electromagnetic transmission so they bioresonate with your body. Once they've done that, they can transmit that from satellites or cell towers or aircraft or any number of ways and that signal will only affect you and nobody else. In other words, everybody standing next to you is not going to hear the content because their receiver is not tuned to that bioresonance. There's a bioresonance to every individual, just like our fingerprint. Every person has an individual DNA, a different bioresonance. And so uh, the Stockland, the original Stockland patent is on my website where Stockland was able to go voice the skull with pulse tra uh, transmissions in 92. And then after the, the rest of the development went black ops. We don't really know what happened after that. We knew we could put voices in indivi uh, to, uh, group people's heads. What they did, and I know from the Russian trans translation, from Cheryl Welch from reading all her translated psychotronic stuff from Russia that they figured out how to biocode these microwaves so that it can attack specific individuals. They basically analyze your DNA and they then use supercomputers to encode the signals. And you basically convert DNA information into ionic information into computer information. So that's going from DNA to ions, but we're, for the brain, we're interested in the opposite, going from ions to DNA. We have the ion channels that are going through the, um, the spiking, or in some cases, the non-spiking behavior. It's influencing the fidelity of the DNA polymerase so that the, the time series of the, of the calcium, say, turns into a spatial series of changes in the DNA sequence, which you can then read out or compute on. And not just for the RNAs and other molecular identifiers, but what the brain was thinking uh, during uh, activity. All of us speak to ourselves in our head. That's how we, it's strange that we have to communicate to ourselves by speaking, right? But we will just sit there talking to ourselves. So as we are talking, there's a certain pattern for every word we say. What they're doing is looking at the pattern in the brain, and then they're matching that pattern uh, they're putting that into a database. If you think of those words, and the, the beauty of this is there's, there, you know, most of the words in the dictionary we don't say, but a, a subset of these words, actually a small subset, we use all the time. So if you can match the patterns in somebody's brain to the, to the, uh, to the patterns in the database, you can literally start to read their mind. Every time a word comes up, you know it. Oh, that word came up for that individual. Now, will the patterns be identical in every person? Probably not, though the information will be stored in slightly different places, but it wouldn't take long for you to train a machine to read your mind. Now, that's just the beginning. They may be able to have algorithms sophisticated enough and they get enough samples, enough data, that, it, that, the, that the AI could actually learn over time uh, uh, what the general rules are for different words and then you could apply it to anybody. Without verbalizing anything, you could literally start to talk, communicate with other people. So my lecture, we could all be standing here silently. <laughs> and I could just be communicating it to you. Uh, you. I could be talking, you would talk to people, they could be, you could literally have conversations with people without ever getting on your phone anywhere in the world. You know, good, goodbye WeChat or Google Hangouts. <laughs> we could all just be on our brainwaves, right? Communicating with our friends. They could be dropping in on us. Very strange if we think about it.
so that when that person goes to speak out about it, when they go to seek help from their fellow human beings and their fellow human beings say, what is it that's happening to you? The target will then say, I'm hearing voices inside my head. But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms. And they will conclude that this person must be crazy. And as a result, they will recommend psychological evaluation for that person. You can see the way this is going to go and the way it is going right now as good people, helpless people that are being abused and tortured and enslaved and experimented upon in America today. American citizens cry out for help from their fellow Americans and their fellow Americans say, why don't you take some Prozac because we think you're schizophrenic when well, this is a highly technical program all of the symptoms are induced by a technology that is so fucking sophisticated it is horrifying beyond description this technology can also tap into the optical nerve of the target and the auditory system of the target so that those monitoring the target can see what the target is seeing and hear what the target is hearing this information is then downloaded and stored on a computer in a highly secure classified site on servers that are guarded by some of the tightest security in the world. So the ability to do this, the ability to download information, that is like what the military and other people are, are that's their holy grail. There's a number of companies now that are looking at ways to write digital information into DNA because you know you would only need about a, a room full of DNA to record all of the digital data that exists today, which is quite extraordinary. So we'll be able to outsource, we'll be able to upload our memories to the cloud. So let's say you don't want to, you want that memory forever, right? You're like, it's automatically probably being stored in the cloud for you without you thinking about it. Just like these automatic backups on your computer, you know, everything, there's a copy and there's redundancy and there's like many versions. <laughs> and so, your experience, you could access it later. This results in the individual's entire day, everything they see, everything they hear, everything they experience, and everything they feel being recorded till the end of time. Within the brain, there are tiny structures called microtubules, right? If you think of these as straws, but they're straws through which flows light. In fact, photons of light known as biophotons, and that each one of these is a package of information that flows around, you know, these tiny structures in the brain. This light is carrying, of course, the memories, and we know DNA is also producing these biophotons of light. This is well, well studied and is well understood. So the interface between the brain and the DNA would therefore be these biophotons. Now this is where if you can transfer knowledge and you can communicate because your connect your brain is wirelessly connected to the internet there's no reason you couldn't extract memories which are just data out of one brain and put them in another brain now what would it mean to share memories all of a sudden you know elon musk you want to know like what you know what he's thinking you could get his memories from yesterday and live his like entire day. Although the connectivity of the brain is where we are processing experiences, even utilizing recalled memories and writing new memories to the hard drive, that it's more like a RAM with a round and access memory rather than being the hard drive. The DNA would be effectively our hard drive where all the bulk of the information we're not using is being written to. So it could be that in the future that we'll find a way to download people into DNA and move them across into other bodies. So this is an astonishing step forward in these kind of science fiction type ideas. When our brains are connected to the internet, our physical bodies become less important. Now think about that. If our brains are connected to the internet and if our brains are all connected, all of us connected, I could literally go into your head and see through your eyes. So all of a sudden, like for a day, like, you know, a lot of us, because you're entrepreneurs, think it would be cool to go inside Elon Musk's head for a day and walk around. Well, Elon Musk may, out, may allow people to, to get that feed and literally live 
through what he sees. Because of my responsibilities in surveillance as a otherwise normal security specialist, uh, I would show this technology at work. And it was through the perspective, of course, of the camera and what I was told that it was obvious it was being uh, used through the eyes of the targets. Um, so I have seen it and it is absolutely remarkable. It's just like a first person, you know, video game or something where you you see right through the eyes of the individual. And so the there's two aspects to the technology. Number one, there is the actual what is essentially receiving the signal from the individual themselves. Uh, and that signal, it goes on within the human mind. Um, I'm not going to get into exactly how the entire human brain works, but basically those optical signals are, are interpreted by the brain, and then you, you perceive them as vision. You perceive them as pictures and so forth, but this is all uh, electrical signals within the brain. Uh, and so the exact same thing, the data is taken in through the eyes, and then your brain renders it in a visual form that you, we know as sight. The exact same thing happens with the computer. Uh, the data is sent to the computer, and then it is rendered uh, in the form of a picture that people can look at. As far as I'm aware, it's real time. There may be a second or two delay, but it is as it is happening. They can actually see through the eyes of the target. It's done all remotely. And that is rendered, of course, in uh, essentially real time on a computer screen. And then it is to the point where it's so accurate, where you can actually see the individual pores on someone's face. Uh, see scars and nicks and so forth. And so you can understand how if you had several people, for example, that you were able to do this, you can uh, through see through their eyes in a room or on a street corner or within an office building, wherever it is, you can get total situational awareness simply by looking through their eyes and you can see through basically three, four, it's like being three or four or five different people all at the same time. The next thing that is really interesting is, you know, everybody's talking about augmented reality and VR right now. If uh, you've taken uh, any drugs like LSD, suddenly uh, the, uh, it becomes real, right? Our minds are actually doing AR or VR, right? Putting dragons in the room and creating like all this stuff. We're able to, the point is, we are able to do that with our brains as they exist right now. So there's no need for external hardware. Once we tap into the brain, our minds itself can actually cre create overlays of AR and VR. If we have algorithms that stimulate the right things and give it the right data, we could literally see a screen pop up. We call it hallucinating, right? But these would be controlled uh, hallucinations run by algorithms that would give us everything AR would without any glasses, without any contact lenses. This technology can be used to beam images and even motion pictures into one's brain. Images and motion pictures that are so realistic that you think you're actually watching a movie or seeing something in reality. It's like a virtual reality 3D rendering that takes place within the target's mind. But you can imagine us entering entirely living in the real world as we do now and also living in this virtual world uh, where they are combined in a, in, right inside our minds. But as soon as we connect our brains to the internet, there's emotions are also data. We could start literally to feel somebody else's pain. And now we say, I feel your pain. We don't really feel their pain. But in the future, we may actually really feel their pain. Like if they're sad, all of a sudden we could tap in, you know, to your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend, and you could be like, oh my God, I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel your anxiety, you know? This technology can also be used to manipulate the emotions of the target. It can induce fear, love, hate. It can cause you to be nervous. It can cause you to be confident. It can cause you to be depressed. It can cause you to be happy. It can cause you to feel any fucking emotion at any time by artificially inducing them. So, you know, like any technology, uh, there are great things we could do. And then there are very horrible things that could result from it that are unanticipated. Now, if somebody hacks into your cell phone or your bank account, they can steal your identity. But it's not your real identity. 
it's more like your money. <laughs> and that's bad enough, right? That's pretty bad if you get hacked um, and they steal your, you know, they do identity theft. But if they're, if they're connected, if your brain is connected directly to the internet, then it will be real identity theft. They could take you. They could literally erase you. They could reprogram you in a way without you even knowing it. So every, you think you're in control of your own will, but it's actually somebody else. It can literally stop your own thoughts from happening and replace them with other thoughts uh, by sending thoughts to your head. And it's so sophisticated that you cannot tell where these thoughts are coming from. There's no way to, to discern that they are coming from somewhere other than your own mind. So you can imagine how bad this would be for people that don't even realize this technology exists. And they're having these thoughts which they think are spontaneous because uh, being under the influence of this technology now, kind of having been on both sides of it, I am, I am just amazed um, at the way it works. And I know that the thoughts that they beam into your head originate from the exact same place in your mind that your own natural thoughts originate from. So if I didn't know I was under the influence of this technology, then I would have no idea that anyone was influencing my thoughts at all. And that's exactly what it can be used for. It can be used to sway people in terms of their opinion, to make them go along with a certain agenda. It can be used to turn groups of people or individuals against each other uh, for whatever purpose. And who do we trust with this technology? Well, apparently not Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> He didn't do that good a job at protecting our data. <laughs> you know, do we trust a government? Do we trust uh, Donald Trump? <laughs> do we trust, who do we trust? Yeah, decentralized, a blockchain, right? There's, you, uh, you're gonna have to have technology uh, that protects us. Technology which really doesn't exist today. And it has to be so foolproof and we have to have so much faith in it that we're willing to open up our brains to that potential of being hacked. So my final slide here is that, you know, our future could go two ways, right? We could literally create heaven on earth. So we are all one giant being and we are all working in unison and we are experiencing these amazing things. Or it could be hell where there's some evil AI or evil people controlling everything we do and we're more like zombies you know where we don't even know it like we think we're free and we're not actually free one of the things i'm concerned about is the technology as it's being researched and developed in seattle utilizes emotion manipulation and behavior manipulation uh without the game stalking and without the voice of skull aspects and so this use of the technology can be done very covertly to the point where the person it's being used against will not know that this technology is being used against them. And that is one of my main concerns and one of the reasons why I want to bring more light to this technology and to this issue because this technology could potentially be, be being used against tens to hundreds of millions of Americans every day. I rec I, um, mentioned in some of my podcasts how there are field events where they will not direct this technology at an individual, but create a general field of frequency in a geographical area so that everybody that within that geographical area is feeling the effects of the technology. It's more of a general application of the technology instead of an individual specific application of the technology. But when you consider that use of it and the fact that it is used for emotion and thought and behavior modification that we could potentially be looking at many, many millions of people across the country that are under the influence of the technology uh, today, right now. It's going to be very hard to stop. It is going to be very hard to stop. Think about it. You know, it's sort of a one-way path. I've never seen humanity roll back technology. What we can do is control it. So like with nuclear weapons, we've barely kept those in control, you know, with other weapons. Not so much, um, like chemical weapons, but we, we need to start talking about this now. There is a very real risk that you are going to become a full-blown, 24-7 targeted individual. And this technology at that point, when it is nationwide, will be used by automated computer, supercomputer software programming 
uh, that will manipulate the emotions and the behavior and the thoughts of everybody in the United States of America. And it can all be done remotely. It's very much like the, the microchip kind of uh, tracking the New World Order, this entire, you know, uh, control grid that's supposed to be rolled out against the American people someday. And I'm here to tell you that uh, it's already here. There isn't going to come a day where there's troops in the streets and tanks rolling down uh, your neighborhood and riot gear and all this stuff. We might have isolated incidents like that. It might get that like that every once in a while. But the, the true control grid is this technology, voice to skull, hive mind, behavior manipulation technology. And it can all be done remotely. It can be done simply by targeting you with the frequency locking into the resonant frequency of your DNA and your mind and in that manner completely track and trace and control you uh, 24 hours a day and it's highly highly valuable uh, for intelligence purposes and military purposes corporate espionage purposes and uh, it is amazing the extent to which this technology works it is it's so far advanced beyond what most people are aware of, it's truly mind-blowing. And I think that's a big part of educating people is making them understand that, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, this mm -hmm. is possible and it is being done right now today.